Hello, everybody. It is time now for Let's Talk College Football. Nothing but college football as we get set to talk college football for the week of October 15th, 2016. The season just keeps flying by. We will discuss my five picks from last week, tell you how I did, and five more picks coming up for the week of October 15th, and good, bad, and the ugly, in which I discuss teams outside the Big 12 who were good, some nationwide were bad, and one definitely symbolized U-G-L-Y, and that's no lie, and they had no alibi. I promise you that much. We'll talk about that team in a little bit that was ugly with the capital U. But we begin our show with the Big 12 thumbs up, thumbs down. The Oklahoma Sooners, after losing the Golden Hat Trophy to Texas in 2015, last weekend it was golden for the Crimson and Cream, reclaiming the trophy, thanks to getting revenge, 45-40, to 40, and three players played a big role in that Sooner win. Talking about D.D., Mr. P., and Mr. B. First, D.D. Westbrook. Monster game for him. Ten receptions, over 230 yards receiving, both school records, as well as Samaje P. Ryan, over 200 yards rushing, and Baker Mayfield, nearly 400 yards through the air, accounting for four touchdowns, including three passing. Oklahoma needed every single point and every single bit of yardage they could get to outlast the Longhorns in the Red River Shootout. And Kansas State's proof that sometimes quality is better than quantity. Despite the fact that Pat Mahomes of Texas Tech had a monster game through the air and Texas Tech outgained Kansas State, the Wildcats came up with a couple of huge plays, neither from the offense in this sequence I'm about to describe, to help defeat the Red Raiders last Saturday night in Manhattan. Talking about DJ Reed with the pick six in the first half, as well as Byron Pringle right before halftime with a kickoff return for a touchdown. Sometimes you have to come up with different ways to win games, unconventional ways. And, you know, that night Kansas State got three offensive touchdowns, but also a special team score and a defensive touchdown. Kansas State, again, proof that sometimes quality is better than quantity. And Mason Rudolph, boy, did he have a nice second half for the Cowboys. Remember, Iowa State was leading by 17 points, but the Cowboys didn't quit. And Mason Rudolph, his numbers show it all. Over 350 yards through the air, had four touchdown passes, including two to James Washington, who had two scores in the game. Oklahoma State erases a 17-point deficit and beats Iowa State 38-31. Now for the thumbs down. Well, Charlie Strong, not Charlie Strong, head coach, although you know he's on the hot seat, but also, too, Charlie Strong, defensive coordinator. Now, remember, he demoted Vance Bedford this past week after Cal beat Texas a few weeks ago. Texas gave up over 500 yards in that game. And then the following weekend, still watering against Oklahoma State, where Texas gave up over 550 total yards. Well, that's when Strong promoted himself to defensive coordinator, demoted Vance Bedford to positions coach, and what happened, not only did the experiment not work, but it backfired big time because Texas set a school record for most yards sacrificed in a single game. We're talking 672. So Charlie Strong knows that time is running out to secure his job. All right, good, bad, and the ugly. Let's begin with the good in Florida State, who I have definitely given a hard time to this year, and rightfully so after a rocky September, losing a couple. But Jimbo Fisher's squad erased a halftime deficit and played a strong second half, and despite Miami's um, late charge to try to tie the game up, Florida State blocks an extra point, and the Seminoles go into Miami and knock off a Miami team that was getting up in the top ten in the country, and the Seminoles are proof that they are still a team that plays with a lot of pride. They didn't quit against Miami and the Seminoles with a big win in South Florida. And how about the play of Texas A&M? Now, that was one of those weird games because A&M got up by 21 against Tennessee, but Volunteers came back, tied the game up, and then we had overtime, and in double OT, there was Trevor Knight who had the winning score in the game. Now, Knight's passing yards are not going to impress you, he only completed 50% of his passes and had 239 yards, a couple of touchdowns, and a couple of picks. But he ran for 110 yards, three TDs on the ground, including the game winner. And so far, Texas A&M has an unblemished record, and they also have something, too, that they big-time need this week, rest. 
They have a bye week, and they'll need it because Alabama is coming soon. And got to give it up to Washington and Washington State. First, the Huskies, they continue to win, and they continue to win big. They go into Oregon and absolutely annihilate the Ducks, just absolutely slaughter them. Washington right now looks like the team to beat in the Pac-12, but Washington shouldn't just, you know, buy their tickets for the college football playoff just yet, okay? Because later in the season, talking about late November, we got the Apple Cup battle with Washington State, who at the beginning of the year didn't really look like much. After all, they had lost to Eastern Washington, an FCS school. But Wazoo, Mike Leach's squad, goes into Stanford and crushes the Cardinal. And Washington State, you know, I'm not saying they'll beat Washington, but right now it looks like that game in late November between the Huskies and the Cougars will have a lot more riding on it than just simply apples. And give it up to Zane Gonzalez of Arizona State, who sets an NCAA FBS record with his 89th career field goal. And to make it even sweeter for the Sun Devils, those points came in handy in the Sun Devils' win over UCLA. And we got to give it up to Navy. The Navy midshipmen in a game that was definitely not pretty as far as the weather, but pretty as far as the way Navy played it. Midshipmen hand Houston their first loss of the season and likely knocked the Cougars out of the college football playoff chat. Let's go ahead now and get into the bad for the week. We've got to first of all talk about Notre Dame. And, well, they had an ugly weather game uh, this past week in Raleigh against North Carolina State. Only appropriate because Notre Dame's season so far has been ugly. This one, a low-scoring game, might have played a big role in so the special teams. NC State beats Notre Dame, and for Brian Kelly, the heat might be on, according to the late great Eagles senior Glenn Fry. Already Notre Dame's fourth loss, and we haven't even reached Halloween yet. Who would have thought that? We also have to say Oregon. Now, we know that Oregon isn't the Oregon of old, and if you lose at home to Washington, that's one thing. But they got absolutely pounced in the game. And Mark Helfrich, yeah, he's going to join that list on the hot seat. He may not be able to survive this year as head coach of the Quack Attack. And Stanford, you know, David Shaw's done a heck of a job there. And so, and I knew that Stanford this year wasn't going to be as good. But come on, they get crushed at home by Washington State. Okay, you get crushed by a team that lost to Eastern Washington at the beginning of the year. Um, Stanford right now, after getting humiliated by Washington and now losing to Washington State in lopsided fashion, yeah, I wonder what the heck's going on in Palo Alto. And the Cincinnati Bearcats, boy, were they atrocious this past week. Uh, yeah, they were pretty bad. Not just losing to UConn, but the fact of the matter, not getting a touchdown. Matter of fact, just three field goals in the game for a Bearcat team that you thought could do more than just three field goals against the UConn Huskies. Um, it's not like you're playing Ohio State or Alabama, by the way. And here's the real sad factor for Cincinnati. They had two net rushing yards. Two against the UConn Huskies. <laughs> Need I say more? And what the heck happened in North Carolina? Coming off a big win at Florida State with the long field goals, time right out, and then they only scored three points at home against Virginia Tech and get annihilated. Wow, losing by more than 30 to the Hokies. But all that's pale in comparison to now the ugly. And this is big time ugly. Rutgers, okay? I know you're playing Ohio State and Michigan, maybe the two best teams in the Big Ten and both playoff contenders, okay? But can you at least score a point in either game? How about this? How about try? How about play some defense? They lost to the Buckeyes 58-0 just two weeks ago. And then this past week, 78 to nothing to Michigan. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Get this. In the game, Michigan outgains Rutgers 600 yards to 39. Wow. Gets even better. Because how many yards rushing? How many yards rushing Rutgers had in the game? Five. They had five. That's it. Five yards rushing. And I'll tell you what, the MVP of the game, from the Rutgers' point of view, was probably, you know, Michael Centron. He was the busiest Rutgers Scarlet Knight of them all. He punted 16 times in the game. I've never heard of anybody punting 16 times in one game. Wow. He definitely was the busiest Scarlet Knight of them all. In fact, I'm 
pretty sure the next day, um, he got a six pack of ice packs for that foot. That's often it was used to punt against Michigan. So Rutgers, that's UGLY for you. All right. Well, my picks last week, uh, maybe not as ugly as how Rutgers played, but I'm not proud of them, okay? They started well, OU covering against Texas. All right, that was good. Um, actually, it was OU and Texas covering the total. So very, very good in that situation. And another game I feel good about, Kansas covering the spread. It was a master lock, easy. TCU was a four-touchdown favorite. The Jayhawks lost by a point, so I cover in that one. But the other three games, yeah, I forget it. It all went bad pretty fast, okay? It was not good. Oklahoma State did come from behind to win, but they were favored by 17. They only went by seven, so I'm a loser there. Arkansas tried to get a backdoor cover, but ran out of time. Alabama uh, wins by more than 14, but I took the Razorbacks in the 14, so I lose. And I look good for one half with Miami, a three-point favor against Florida State, but Florida State had to go come from behind and win. And good for Florida State, but bad for me because I had Miami covering with three, and Miami couldn't, and Miami lost the game. So two and three this past week, and for the year, a documented 13 and 12. So still above 500. Okay, quickly, here are my five picks for this week. Iowa State at Texas. Longhorns favored by 15. Uh, Texas might win this game. They're at home. It's revenge for Texas after losing and getting shut out in Ames, Iowa. But I don't trust Texas's defense, so I think Iowa State hangs around, and I think the uh, Cyclones will cover the 15. Bama against Tennessee. You know, the Volunteers got to be pissed after that game last week. They fought so hard to come back and then lose in double OT. Bama's on a roll. I still think, though, Tennessee at home keeps it a competitive game, so give me the Volunteers plus 13 and a half. West Virginia, Texas Tech, the line has changed. Now the Mountaineers are favored by one after being a one-point underdog a good part of the week. You know, Texas Tech, I know they play well against West Virginia at home usually. In this case, though, I think West Virginia will do it with the ground attack. I think the ground attack will work for the Mountaineers in this game. After all, Texas Tech can't stop anybody on the ground. A lot of points in this game, but I think West Virginia um, will be able to come out on the winning end of the scoreboard. So given the Mountaineers minus the one, you've got Kansas and you've got Baylor, and you're going to have a Baylor win. We know that. Baylor's at home, but 34 and a half points, that's a ton of points. 34 and a half, I'm not going to do it. Kansas, Kansas has actually improved a little bit. So give me the Jayhawks plus the 34 and a half. And finally, Stanford, Notre Dame, or what might be called the disappointment game. They'll be playing under the lights. And for Notre Dame, thankfully, in better weather than what they had to do with at Raleigh, North Carolina. David Shaw's job is not on the line at Stanford, okay? He's safe. But the same may not be said about Brian Kelly. I think Notre Dame plays in desperation and plays a better game. Home field advantage, give me the Fighting Irish minus the three. That does it for my edition of Let's Talk College Football. Just a reminder that we will have post-game of Kansas State and Oklahoma sometime early Saturday evening, so please check it out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Let's Talk College Football.